Muy buenos días a todas y todos y bienvenidos a la sesión. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Hernán Montenegro. I'm representative for PAHO WHO in Uruguay. I'll be moderating this virtual seminar or webinar. This is our fourth seminar on policy options to strengthen and transform healthcare systems in the Americas from PAHO. The series have had very important uh, calling with participation of more than 40 countries in each session and today's no exception. At this time, we have more than 600 people participating and surely we will see them grow in number in the following minutes. This time and as we did also in 2021, we will be addressing a central point in the strategic agenda to attain universal health. I mean, social participation. We have entitled the webinar, Social Participation, Key Element in the Strengthening and Transformation of Healthcare Systems. And we have invited a set of distinguished panelists who we will begin introducing at, at, it, at its time. But before beginning, I would like to tell you that we will be offering interpretation, simultaneous interpretation in the four official languages for the organization. I mean, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French, as well as in sign language. To select a language, you must click the globe icon in the lower part of your Zoom screen. We also remind you to adjust your video configuration to side-by-side -side mode. That way we can, you can see presentation and speaker both on the same screen. Please uh, be, be aware that you may submit your remarks at any point in the seminar via the chat and questions may be submitted via the Q&A section. <laughs> We also remind you, especially to our panelists and also colleagues in the organization, to please um, silence their microphone, mute their microphone during this activity. And lastly, we would like to ask that our panelists open up their cameras and microphones or activate and to speak slowly to facilitate simultaneous translation. To begin the seminar, I have this great honor to hand the floor to Dr. Chris Etienne, director for the Pan American Health Organization, Regional America's office from the World Health Organization. Welcome, Dr. Etienne, and thank you so much for being with us today. I, I am happy to welcome you to this, the fourth webinar in a series of virtual seminars that PAHO has organized in recent months. And those seminars have been on policy options to strengthen and transform health systems in the Americas. In previous seminars, we have examined critical issues of health systems transformation in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic recovery. We have examined the challenges in health financing to achieve universal health within the of fiscal situation. need to address the multiple and complex barriers to access health, especially for our most vulnerable populations. Today, I really am particularly pleased to be with you to open this seminar on an issue of utmost relevance, and yet so often neglected on our countries, and namely the importance of effective social participation in health as a means to realize the right to health in the Americas. One, one of the most important publications from WHO in recent years, entitled Voice, Agency and Empowerment for Universal Health Coverage, rightly notes that for people's views to be aired and heard requires an environment where they feel empowered to speak their voice. Doing so, gives populations agency over their own health a key step to the right to health. Clear lessons have emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic that need to be aired and heard. Firstly, 
we must be better prepared in the future. Secondly, we must build trust between governments and the people in the generation and application of scientific evidence in institutions and in the management of information, misinformation, and disinformation. Thirdly, we must invest and build expansive and inclusive health systems to realize the ambition of universal access to health and universal health coverage. And finally, primary healthcare is the foundational strategy to improve individual, family, and community health and resilience in pandemic times, but beyond those. And, <clears throat> sorry, central to this action is the establishment of different participatory spaces as a means to improve the health conditions and the well being of populations. I use this term participatory space with intent, as it has become clear that our countries need to invest in creating, strengthening, and institutionalizing distinctive social participation spaces where people can be informed, can be engaged, where they can become involved and hold accountable health leaders and systems to address the collective need. Social participation in health is particularly important as we transform our health systems based on primary health care. And this is not a new, a, a, a new idea. This has been around certainly since 1978. Through engaging local populations, we assess and address the needs of people where they live. We link social care with health service provision and social protection at the community level. And we integrate health promotion and disease prevention into health service delivery at that level. Placing people at the center of health not only means the delivery of people-centered care, but also, and importantly, the full participation and engagement of people and society in the design, functions, and governance of their health systems. A number of countries throughout the region of the Americas have established national constitutional obligations and legislative action that recognize the right to health and have established formal mechanisms for participation and dialogue, but they are yet too few. If we are to, better prepare, to be better prepared for future pandemics and to truly transform health systems for universal health, our goal must be to mobilize the region of the Americas and to expand the establishment of structured formal mechanisms for social participation, while continuing at the same time to recognize and support the contribution of informal processes. In September of 2021, the PAHO member states unanimously approved the strategy for building resilient health systems and post COVID-19 pandemic recovery to sustain and, product and, and, and protect public health gains. And this strategy called on countries to strengthen the governance of health systems, increasing social participation and building capacity in the essential public health functions. And these actions go hand in hand and require investment and commitment from our local, regional and national leaders. Moving forward, we will continue to support our countries in the analysis of the essential public health functions and in the development of participatory spaces for dialogue. Finally, I am delighted to announce that today we are launching the Spanish, Portuguese and French language versions of the WHO's handbook on social participation for universal health a publication that provides practical guidance to policymakers on how to achieve regular and systematic government engagement with the population, with communities and with civil society. It is through such engagement, commitment and political will 
that we can effectively place social participation in health at the core of health systems transformation in the region of the Americas. Social participation is fundamental to achieving the goals that we've set ourselves. I certainly do look forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists this morning. And, and I hope that this will be the first of many participatory spaces that we will have as we intensify country action in support of a greater, more effective and deepened social participation in health in the future. But I dare say that we all must learn how, how to create these spaces, how to engage in, in, in effective ways to allow the voices to be heard. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussions. Over to you, Adrian. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne. Thank you so much, Dr. Etienne, for your welcoming words and for once again highlighting the importance of this goal in public health, which is so important that is coming from so many decades ago, but also in reminding us that it continues being very relevant based on lessons from the pandemic and that this the focus of this session has to deal with implementation, how to implement and make this policy effective. and also in highlighting the importance of this new WHO guide to support social participation processes. Thank you so much, Dr. Etienne, for your words. We will now begin with the presentation from Dr. James Fitzgerald, who will introduce existing commitments and mechanisms in the Americas regarding social participation. Dr. James Fitzgerald is director of healthcare systems and services from the Pan American Health Organization. He's a doctor in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Berlin, and he has a journey of more than 20 years at PAHO WHO. He's also author of many articles on his uh, specialty area. Welcome, James. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Hernan. Good morning, uh, panelists. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to to really build on what Dr. Etienne has, has very clearly said from the outset, the, the importance for us to really intensify the work around social participation as a strategic area of work um, to transform and to strengthen our health systems uh, moving forward. I have a short presentation for you today um, around some of the overarching mandates that have guided us in this work um, what's coming for the future and what we're doing in, in, in terms of our, our, our country action. And so I'll spend the next uh, 10 minutes outlining a little bit of these elements for you. Some of the key messages I really wanted to leave here with you this morning um, really relates to the, to the importance of, of these mandates that we already have, this mandate really uh, recognizing social participation in health as a critical and fundamental element of health systems transformation strengthening. Dr. Etienne was very clear. It's been incorporated since the Alma Ata in 1978 in the Alma Ata Declaration of Primary Health Care, the fundamental importance of social participation in health. And yet here we are, we continue to discuss and dialogue and really um, see how best we can really improve and optimize effective social participation in, in strengthening uh, health policy and, and health systems transformation. One of, I think, the, the, the more critical areas is, is the relationship between social participation and the essential public health functions. This is a message that's come out very clearly from what we've seen in COVID-19. Um, the lack of articulation between uh, populations, uh, people, the community, that really in many cases felt isolated and detached from health systems and the actions within health systems as governments and, and, and health systems were really struggling to tackle uh, the surge of COVID-19 throughout the Americas. And finally, how social, particip social participation is transversal in, in, within the policy cycle um, and, and, and how we need, to build, building on the lessons that we've seen in recent years, how we really need to, as Dr. Etienne said, empower um, actors, stakeholders within uh, civil society to get their voices heard and to ensure effective participation in the processes relating to decentralization, segmentation, and intersectoriality of, of health systems. Um, so let me pass through a little bit uh, the history of some of this in terms of 
moving and in terms of our recent mandates. The sustainable health agenda for the Americas is the overarching um, uh, policy framework document for, for PAHO member states, um, whereby we have specific um, goals that are closely related to the development and adoption of the SDG, um, but specifically addressing the context of the, of the Americas within, within the health agenda. The sustainable health agenda, um, in particular in goal two, speaks specifically to stewardship and governance for health. And, and within this, uh, there's a whole, whole approach within this to really ensure promotion of social participation, uh, not just directly uh, within the health sector itself, but with an overarching approach within um, looking at health and all policies across the whole of government and the whole of society, and in particular, to address the core fundamental values of solidarity, equity, equity and universality in the development of, of public health action. And this really is one of the main drivers for our work and subsequent mandates in the organization that we, we have. Going back to 2014, um, our member states adopted the strategy for universal access to universal health coverage. Uh, and this strategy is a, is a core pillar of our work in guiding health system strengthening actions in, 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 in our countries and really transforming uh, health systems to ensure that everyone has access to comprehensive, integrated, uh, quality health services without incurring financial hardship. Within that strategy, we had um, important discussions around okay, what is the role of our civil, of civil, civil society in this process? What is the role of people, the community and families as we begin to construct policies that really need to shape and transform health systems to, to achieve that overarching uh, objective? And it's really important to note that the second priority identified um, as a function of the role of, of the organization is to really promote the establishment of formal mechanisms for participation and dialogue um, for the development and inf implementation of inclusive policies and to look at the oversight and accountability mechanisms so that we can achieve the overarching objectives of universal access to health and universal health coverage. This then had moved forward into the discussions around universal health in the 21st century, 40 years of Alma Ata. Uh, Dr. Etienne convened a high level commission led by President Bachelet in Chile um, that really looked at this uh, issue and, and issued 10 recommendations about how we can, within the context of 40 years of the Declaration of Alma Ata, um, really strengthen the primary healthcare approach as an overarching strategy to achieve universal health in the Americas. The Commission was really, really adamant on one thing, and that is that creating social participation mechanisms, they need to be genuine, they need to be deep, they need to be inclusive, and they need to be accessible. And they need to have these interactions uh, that are necessary from the intercultural and functional perspective to ensure the necessary diversity in the development of policies that will ensure the full exercise of the right to health in the Americas. And there's a whole chapter in this that really addresses some of the key actions that countries can really do to develop uh, these deep, inclusive and accessible uh, mechanisms uh, for, for more effective social participation in health. Following COVID-19, as I mentioned, <clears throat> there has been a, a bigger movement um, that obviously started well before uh, COVID-19 to get to, to obtain a much deeper social participation. And with Deepa and our colleagues in, in WHO, uh, Dr. Ed Jim mentioned this very important uh, publication on voice, agency, and empowerment, the handbook on social participation for universal health coverage. This is a very important publication that presents very nicely, very concisely, some of the critical areas of work that we need to develop um, at the national level to structure, organize in a manner that's transparent and inclusive the social participation mechanisms uh, at the national level. This is taking on a whole other level now as we begin regional and national consultations. Uh, there will be global virtual consultations around a resolution at 20, uh, if that will move forward for 2024 and uh, that will ultimately uh, be, be presented for con further consideration of the World Health Assembly in 2024. That's not to say that we're waiting for 2024 to have this guidance. No, we are fully in, uh, working with our countries through the approach of the essential public health functions as one of the principal mechanisms in governance to strengthen public health and support substantive reform processes in countries to achieve universal health, ensuring that social participation is fundamentally linked in that. Just a, a quick reminder on public health here and its linkages with social participation. Public health here is defined as the knowledge and practice of collective action by states 
collective action, meaning the broad engagement of civil society groups and stakeholders to improve the health of the population and effectively guarantee the right to health. And so the essential public health functions are those capacities of health authorities at all institutional levels, jointly with civil society, and that is key to strengthen the health system's functions and to ensure the full exercise of public health by really acting on the multiple determinants that affect health of the population. And so how does this trans translate within the context of the overarching policy cycle that we have to strengthen public health functions? As you know, the public, public health functions uh, are being developed around the policy cycle, cycle of assessment, policy development, resource allocation, and access. And we've had a number of very important webinars uh, on this issue. But as if we look particularly on social participation, we can see that it is particularly one aspect of the policy development where we look at social participation, social mobilization, oversight, participation, legislative and regulatory frameworks, but it also transverses all of the other areas where, where we need to have effective engagement in, in resource allocation and in, in ensuring that access is effective and comprehensive, not just in, in urban centers, but through, throughout the whole uh, country and fundamentally in the assessment and monitoring and evaluation of the conditions of the health population so that we can return back and adjust our policies to address uh, the differentiated needs of multiple groups. We've just highlighted here for you some of the uh, areas of action, how, how social participation is intrinsically linked in this policy cycle process for the assessment of the social, uh, for the essential public health functions. Uh, we see actions in Brazil and Peru and El Salvador with regard to the structuring um, of processes of, 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 of society within health policy development, or, or, or indeed in, 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 in indigenous movements throughout the region, in the participation of interventions on social, uh, social uh, intervention, or in Chile, really on issues on access to high cost, high cost medicines with the participation of social groups uh, around the Ricarte Soto law. One very interesting process that is being developed, linking with more formal mechanisms that Dr. Etienne mentioned, is the participation of subnational government spaces that Bolivia has developed, really addressing the, the right to health for vulnerable populations, including LGBT. So country action is critical to this process. And here we see from a health systems perspective, how so effective social participation can induce change irrespective of the structure of, of, of the health system. We are all aware that we have fundamental problems and challenges within health systems in the region. Segmentation, fragmentation, lack of financing, inadequate distribution of, of health workforce. Um, and some of the major transform transformations, major reform processes are on, uh, that are ongoing at the moment are really looking at issues of segmentation, uh, particularly from those systems that are more uh, insurance-based in, in the decentralization expansion of access and coverage within the countries based on, on, on primary health care, and then the beginning of, of intersectoral actions to, to really address the, the, the social, uh, economic, and, and environmental determinants of health. Um, and here we've outlined for you how some countries are really uh, identifying a greater role in, in terms of civil society. For example, in the segmentation area, where, uh, where countries from the solidarity perspective are looking at how they can ensure greater participatory space in the allocation of resources and the funds regulation or in decentralization and expansion where, where civil society groups are beginning to look jointly with government in the analysis of barriers to health, be they financial, be they financial geographical, uh, intercultural, to, to move forward to look at the prioritization of needs at the local level, to develop local policy aligned with regional uh, and national policy, and to ensure effective oversight of the functions uh, of the health system. And then, of course, there's the intersectoral action where we have the, the establishment of, of more participatory groups looking at the analysis and advocacy, um, really making explicit the right to health uh, from the much broader perspective. I'll conclude really highlighting uh, how we're working. We're currently operational in 12 countries looking at issues of the essential public health functions, uh, the gaps analysis, the action plans, and the national health planning process. And we are working arduously with our country offices and with member states around the processes of the organization, the evaluation, the institutional mapping, the measurement of, of capacities, and then the development of action plans. And we've identified within these processes specific areas for interaction and engagement of social stakeholders as part of the mapping processes of the accountability and effective participation mechanisms, and then the strategic planning process. And we feel that this really is a process by which we can begin to 
and develop more structured social participation and support countries in looking at how they uh, oversee and ensure stewardship of social uh, participation from a, an effective manner um, that will really uh, make effective universal access to health and universal health coverage. I'll stop there, Hernan. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a ti, James. El evento de hoy, entonces, se Thanks so much to you, James. So today's event is within the framework of two lines of action that we are carrying out as PAHO WHO. As a first area of work, we have the series of webinars on policy options to strengthen and transform healthcare systems in the Americas. Second, we are undertaking many activities with the goal of strengthening and implementing effective mechanisms for promotion of social participation. As was well said by Dr. Fitzgerald, this region um, has the important role of social movements and grassroots organizations for strengthening healthcare systems based on the conception of health as a fundamental right. And the commitment of governments in this domain is clear greater relevance to this consultation process. Our goal today is to generate a space for reflection and debate for key stakeholders in our member states regarding social participation. To open up the section of presentation of country experiences, we have invited Dr. Walter Flores, Executive Director of the Center of Studies for Equity and Governance of Healthcare Systems an organization from civil society in Guatemala, also social researcher on from the Accountability Research Center from the American University in Washington, DC, and part of the healthcare movement of peoples. Dr. Flores obtained a master's and PhD in community health from the Tropical Medicine School in Liverpool. Walter has served as lecturer researcher and consultant in more than 30 countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Welcome, Walter. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. The following minutes, I will try to briefly summarize social participation in the Americas region. Next, please. Social participation has existed in our region for many decades, but it was characterized by having a community organization to support delivery of services. This is what we knew as social participation, especially uh, well, Alma Ata in the 70s and 80s. This was social participation. However, in the 90s and the aughts, it came in with democratizing movements after dictatorships in our region. This emphasis on social participation came in as part of strength, democratic strengthening of our countries in the region. There was progress in, the, in legal frameworks which acknowledged the right to healthcare, social responsibility, also as participation as a right, and many expressions of social participation came in. Municipal councils of health, users associations, per citizens, etc. And in the region, we had a coming of forms of social participation to the degree that in the Latin American Caribbean regions, it was leader worldwide on citizenship participation processes. I remember pretty well, perhaps some of you remember that there were special events during the WHO assembly in order to know more on what Latin America and the Caribbean were doing with social participation. And also there were exchanges between social movements in this region of the world with social and civil society movements in other regions such as Africa and Asia, because what was happening was very important and very relevant. Next, please. However, in the hemos visto el estancamiento. Ese desarrollo que traíamos since stagnation, that uh, development, uh, that leadership uh, is uh, stagnant yeah. now, and there has been weakening of uh, social structure, social participation spaces. One of the main reasons is that due to uh, the commodities uh, 
economic crisis and also in the financial crisis, there are cuts to public uh, budgets in many countries. De participación social y a los mecanismos. Entonces, social participation uh, spaces there and their mechanisms too. So we uh, saw that um, the um, social participation in the region was not as market as before. And we also saw new authorities coming in that uh, in, did not, were not as interested as former ones in this uh, process of social participation to strengthen democracy in our region. Next one, please. Then, now that we are uh, re or uh, taking up this uh, issue again, I think we have to do so and strengthen it, but not as a continuation of what we have because uh, time has gone by and we need a process where there's evolution and adjustment to current situations. Like for example, in the 90s and 2000s, even if we were uh, global leaders, we weren't perfect. Uh, there were uh, gaps and barriers uh, for the participation of uh, indigenous and afro descendant uh, populations. So, when we have social participation, now we have to take into account those gaps and we have to take advantage to close them for the inclusive participation of all the population and also create participation mechanisms where um, accountability, democratic governance uh, and uh, participation are explicit. So we have to create new structures wherever they are needed and uh, spaces where they are strengthened. So we have to review the structures we had 20 years ago because if they were 20 years ago, that does not mean that in our current conditions, they will continue uh, working. Next one, please. We also have to create participation spaces that will respond to subnational and territorial realities. As an effect of COVID-19, we know that many of our dialogue exercises went to the virtual space. We were able to progress in the virtual space, but it is not useful to find solutions for all. Altas niveles de desigualdad en cuanto a la, a la conectividad. Because we have much inequality in terms para of algunos, connectivity in our countries. So for some urban areas, pero, for example, uh, para, uh, virtual spa spaces can uh, function very well, but uh, they won't uh, function for um, other regions in our country where we find uh, barriers to connectivity. So. My first concrete step is that we can uh, progress as from now by doing mapping of current y en este mapeo que lo to en progress in social participation. And this mapping it has to be done together with social movements and civil society organizations. In all countries, we have active social movements. And that mapping and preparing roadmaps would be ideal if we do this together with civil society, social movements, and authorities eh, más in each country. De, de Finally, one of the most harmful effects of the pandemic in our systems was weakening and um, Esto va a ser muy de lo, losing uh, trust uh, between authorities and uh, population. And it'll take time to rebuild this. However, citizen participation spaces are appropriate to start rebuilding that trust. So we have to retake and strengthen social participation. That's what we have to do. We have defined that in our legal framework that was more than 20 years ago. And it will also help us to retake trust between authorities and citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter, for this uh, presentation. I'm sure it'll open many questions that we will answer later on. So uh, remember, you can leave your questions through the Q&A uh, session. And uh, at the 
closing of this session, we'll have space for our guests to comment and respond. We now pass the floor to Fernando Villalto, who chairs the um, National Council of Health in Brazil. He has a degree in environmental management by Paraná University, started his work in social mobilization in the 80s and has an extensive work in social control as from 2000. He was uh, elected uh, chair of the National Council of Health in 2018 with the first mandate to 2021, and he was re-elected for the 2021-2024 period. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Piatto. You have the floor. Good morning. I would ask you to um, withhold the presentation for a few seconds so I could tell you a bit, uh, some ideas before I put it up. I would first like to thank you for the invitation. I would like to uh, extend my warmest feeling for Dr. Hernan, Carissa, James, Dr. Walter, who, who spoke just before me. And then later on, we will also have Dr. Luis. I would also like to say that I have not completed my doctorate, but uh, next year I will begin my master's degree and I hope to get there. It's very important for us to recognize that social control uh, popular wisdom it needs to be uh, to be welcomed and to be given its due value. So we wanted to highlight the organization of uh, Peho and Brazil's uh, ties. Uh, we had a meeting in the in the in 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 OMS and uh, Peho's uh, seat in Brazil, and we ran homage to their 85-year-old legation in Brazil. And like Dr. Hugo Gross, I wanted to highlight the relevant role they had. Dr. Carissa had with us. Uh, Dr. Carissa was with us in Brazil personally a few months ago. We also had had the meeting to meet. When I began my mandate as president of the National Health Advisory Board, so I wanted to say it's very important for us to be with you in this activity. I want to put my presentation up right now, but I, I could not uh, uh, help myself saying these words. This presentation gives us an overview of everything we've done in this period and give you a bit about the history of the Uni uh, National Advisory Health Board. As I said, uh, yesterday we celebrated our 80, 85th birthday. Uh, so we had, uh, we, we started working, we moved on from the first NSC to the creation of the Ministry of Health. I won't read the presentation because the presentation will be available I don't I won't read everything because uh, you will have the presentations but what we had was what would call a in reconquering the democracy in our country was uh, the 8th National Health Conference uh, in 1980 C the people did not participate in the health conferences up to them and in, in the movement of the sanitation reform in Brazil and the social movements in Brazil, there was an occupation of the people of the Eighth National Conference. And that is when uh, the people started participating in the unified health system. Uh, so the right to health and from them the report of the right to health underlines the right to health which must consider this process in the evaluation management of uh, policies by the population. So it was uh, the right to health was put in the 
constitution here we underline article one of the federative republic of brazil uh constitution article six and article 196 that says that health is a right of all and a duty of the brazilian state brazil is a is a federative republic so we we understand the union of states and municipalities and uh, uh participative democracy uh, popular sovereignty uh, are a, a constitutional state that is a constitutional that has emanated from the will to the people and a system to guarantee the rights. So the Constitution laid down the overall loose and then the, the doctrinal principles, universality, equity, and integrality, and then law eight. 1,142, uh, we have now celebrate 32 years of these laws, detail the organizational principles and popular participation and regulates popular participation. Some of the issues of law number 8,142 that says the health conference will meet every four years with representation of various health conferences uh we are right now in the process of conference uh at the end of this participation uh i will speak more about it and of course the ideas of what health uh, the health bodies the health advisory committees which are municipal state and government we have over a hundred thousand health uh, uh, advisors in Brazil, over 5,570 municipal councils and 26 uh, state health councils and the federal district. We have local councils and regional councils. In a municipality, we can have dozens of local uh, uh, boards. We have regional boards, dis district boards, a series of places where uh, population may participate, which make up the overall structure of our board. So this is more or less the legislation written by Gilson Carvalho, which is a person who helped draw it up, which speaks about what is sought with social participation in the health context. Now we speak about uh, the control and advisory. Uh, in Brazil, we have the TCU who analyzes uh, the Brazil's accounts federally. So there's a document they drew up in 2015 where they recognize the social control to guarantee the right to health. There, before that, there were questions about how far our advisory board went. And this document uh, that was drafted by them was very important to emphasize and give legitimacy to what we do in our country. So now some of the most important uh, issues of social control in SUS, more than a principle, it is the principle per excellence. It is the difference we have between other systems in the world. Social control, as we say it, at the very root, at the heart of our SUS, of the single healthcare system. There would be no SUS if there were no social control. SUS is the principal par excellence for the popular movement and the health of the system depends on it. The role that social control plays in SUS poses great challenges for the popular movement. Now we see a bit about what we consider to be governance. We always say that uh, public administration that doesn't consider uh, governance and social control in the guarantee to her right to health is in fact uh, giving up having a more democratic representation. Now we have uh, a, a government in Brazil that is finishing right now, which did not at all recognize social control. They refuted it. They ignored it. Eve, 
even though they were fully aware of the role that uh, that social control had, they in fact posed great hurdles to social control. So these are parts of a publication, uh, an article that was written in uh, Konaspi that was published by the Pan-American uh, Pejo in Brazil, in which we say that uh, public administration that does not take into account community participation in management of SUS is missing great opportunities to unite academic, technical, and popular knowledge in the execution of policies and interventions. And the pandemic uh, also gives uh, us uh, uh, backup in saying that, as we said, uh, the 27th uh, government co uh, conference that says, uh, we could say, amanhã vai ser outro dia, which is tomorrow will be another day. I suggest people to hear this song because we are rebuilding this new tomorrow for a long time, and especially in the last few years when it was practically destroyed. So we restarted the process of municipal conferences, and then the state and federal districts in May 23, and then the national conference in July 2 to 5, 2023. Several people who are here attending this, uh, this conference will be invited uh, we want to hold a great celebration of this last period, but the conference isn't an event, it's a process. We have free and thematic events. It is a, a, a very broad uh, participation, participatory event, which will bring together over 7,000 people in Brazil. I would like to wrap up with one of the initiatives uh, that we were speak remembering yesterday, we were looking at our, uh, we took a look at our site and we found 282 news that had to be with the relationship between the Advisory Health Board of Brazil and Pejo Who in Brazil. This is ongoing right now the Laboratory of Innovation in Latin American Practices of Social Participation in Healthcare. Uh, we are, inscription is still open. We invite you to access the site and, and get to know a bit more about the event. We would invite you to participate in these innovations and experiences we have had during the pandemic. We have several publications and now after the pandemic. Now I would like, uh, please move the slide. I would like to show you our, our communication uh, channels and uh, and social networks. So we have YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, which are our open medias for the National Advisory Healthcare Board. Uh, I hope I didn't go over time a lot. Uh, I ask you to put down the presentation and thank you for the people who helped us. Uh, and we always, Dr. Socorro yesterday says, we always wish long life to suits, long life to the Brazilian people, long life to democracy and our country and, and hugs to all. Thank you very much, Mr. Pigato. Thank you very much, Mr. Pigato. Thank you very much for your presentation and the extraordinary evolution of a social movement in Brazil around health. To share particip social participation experiences from the perspective of ministers of health, we have invited Mr. Vidalicia from uh, Uruguay. I am fortunate to work with Luis uh, very frequently Play here in Uruguay. So it is a great pleasure to introduce you, Luis. Luis is, uh, has a degree in nutrition by the Guatemala Universidad del Valle. He has a master's degree in public health in the uh, health uh, university. Uh, I'm sorry, in the health uh, school of uh, the Carlos III Institute in uh, uh, Spain. He coordinates a uh, program in the uh, Minister of Health in Uruguay and his advisor 
of uh, health, particularly concerning prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. Thank you for accepting our invitation, please. Go ahead, please. Very well, Hernan. This pleasure is mutual. Thank you uh, very much. Um, good morning to you all. Thank you uh, for inviting me to participate in this event. Uh, I take advantage to send you uh, Mr. Salinas' uh, greetings, uh, Minister of Health, and also Mr. Miguel Esqueta, who is uh, uh, the Director of Health. We celebrate this launching event um, uh, in um, the languages of our region. I have no doubt that um, it's necessary for countries and health authorities to establish mechanisms to institutionalize this social participation in um, decision making processes, allowing full um, health rights and uh, favoring uh, universal coverage. I will refer to two aspects in which the Ministry of Health integrates social participation as a key element for governance and the processes for identifying and managing conflicts of interest. I'd like to tell you that Uruguay started uh, uh, health system reform uh, process in December 2007. The law creates the integrated health system and is framed within the right of protection to health. Uh, this reform defines the role of the ministry as uh, leading the system and defining health policies and regulating um, care of uh, public and private uh, providers. On the other hand, among the ruling principles of the system, we have respect of the right to of users to inform the um, decisions on their health and the participation of uh, people in their health. Besides, the ministry has different uh, tools from the uh, regulatory point of view for the participation of the civil society organizations. On the one hand, the National Board of Health, which is a deconcentrated organism of the ministry that uh, manages the health system and uh, takes care of the system elements, integrates one work Además, la representative ley and one user representative. The law creates the councils that advise the departmental boards of health of HUNAS, also integrated by workers and users, representatives. Uh, integration and communication among these departmental uh, boards and HUNASA is clearly established and their participation is active, particularly in aspects related with um, system financing and the value that each, uh, uh, that the insurers makes for uh, each user uh, to uh, health providers. Concerning care uh, targets, they don't have formal participation possibilities and sometimes their possible proposals are not necessarily taken into account. Also, the health departmental Social boards are formal spaces for social participation at local level. However, despite the fact that there is user representation, there are limitations concerning local prioritization of problems. So the proposals of these social organizations are not always taken into account, particularly when they are not clearly aligned uh, with the policies um, uh, promoted at central level by the ministry. There have been some civil society achievements in implementing complementation agreements between public and private providers to have um, um, outpatient care, pharmacy, and care in rural areas, uh, particularly among uh, public uh, providers, Además, and also strengthening primary care. Besides law 18,161 that creates the management of healthcare uh, services in the state as main uh, public provider also integrates users and workers in their board made up by five uh, members. 
This is important uh, for governance and integration of so civil society in health authority governance. Our country is developing national uh, health objectives to 2030. It, this defines the health uh, policy in a temporal es uh, um, period that is aligned with SDGs. This is the second time that uh, the country revises uh, its objectives um, after 2015. We continue with this government and uh, that means it is the state policy. Uh, we prioritize critical problems that are then translated in uh, health targets and action lines. As in the first experience, the methodology for developing health uh, objectives means uh, carrying out public consultation. Um, now we have the, uh, a, a draft document that contains all the elements uh, that were mentioned before. This public consultation was published at the um, health ministry website and other uh, state entities and was uh, broadly disseminated in the social media. Uruguay has a very high penetration of the internet and uh, um, wide band uh, availability in the country. Also the different technical areas that participated in preparing these objectives disseminate, disseminated this consultation to um, many um, people. We received comments from scientific societies, the academica, uh, and civil society organizations. These comments were reviewed by the technical areas and when they were considered relevant, uh, the targets were, uh, or the, the action lines were changed. At the same time, we can this process of preparation. We are developing an observatory of the 2030 national um, health objectives. Uh, we will have a website that will allow the people and institutions to get to know the health objectives and then follow up and carry out consultation about implementation and also get to know progress made in the application of uh, different measures. This was done understanding that in the first exercise of uh, health objectives, even with uh, uh, successful implementation, it was not much disseminated and appropriated by the by the people. On the other hand, there are many commissions and councils in the ministry uh, where we integrate social civility. We have a legislative mandate and uh, or an administrative action that um, rules their contribution. There are many, but the ones we should highlight concerning uh, civil society participation are CONACIA that controls tobacco, um, also um, nursing advisory, and also the controller for mental health care. <laughs> These examples show social participation it progresses is, and is established as the right of users uh, that uh, go uh, to become a passive receptor, receptor of policies and treatments in a user that has the right of using uh, goods and services and uh, have uh, actually um, a subject of rights that decides. This participant <laughs> clearly established uh, does not escape, escape some barriers because uh, institutions that participate from the state are um, clearly established in this regulatory act. But when we name social uh, civil society, they have to be the most representatives. And this can generate difficulties when we agree among different uh, organizations of civil society, who and how they participate. The incidencia de estas organizaciones. Finalmente, y aun cuando entendemos que la autoridad sanitaria Finally, and when we understand that healthcare authorities should advance in the countries these social participation mechanisms, it's also necessary to have clear mechanisms for identifying and managing conflicts of interest, in particular to addressing commercial determinants of health. For instance, Uruguay 
approved the framework agreement establishing legal framework, administrative and criminal and, um, sanctions to all public servants with regards to measures regarding interactions with the tobacco industry and ensuring transparency of those of whatever is produced. On the other hand, law from August 19121 from August 2012 establishes for central administration officials the duty of acting and partially in the development of their duties, abstaining of and from intervening in those cases that can give way to interpretations on lack of impartiality. Also prohibiting intervening in affairs that imply conflict of interest, as well as requesting or receiving gifts, bonuses, compensation or advantages for themselves or for others for specific acts in their duty and practice. So in exercising this duty, there should be no conflict of interest. In practice, for instance, the development of norms on frontal labeling of food, government entities, academia, honorary commissions decided unanimously not to provide participation uh, space to industry during the process in developing and limiting interaction in public consultation spaces. In the same manner, Decree 36908 creates a national council in the public uh, health care ministry on policies of prevention on overweight and obesity, norming its workings, institutions that comprise it, defining institutional servants that may sign a declaration of conflicts of interest for identification and management. Once again, I'm at your disposition and thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. Thank you so much, Luis, for sharing us the participate, social participation mechanisms and governance of the Uruguay healthcare system. Now we're giving way to the second part of our seminar. Before that, I wanted to highlight that we have more, hundred, more than 470 participants now at this webinar and we thank you joining. Moving along then with our next presentation, it is a pleasure to invite Rayan, also a former colleague of mine. When I was working in Geneva, so it's a great pleasure to introduce her. She works in the governance and funding department for healthcare systems from the WHO. Dr. Rayan is counselor of healthcare systems in the WHO office from 2006, where she coordinates two very important lines of work, social participation and the development of healthcare systems. Deepa is also a doctor in medicine in Germany and has a PhD in traditional medicine in India. She also has a master's in economy of health from the UK. Welcome, Deepa. Thank you so much, Hernan, and all the other colleagues as well who have um given us some really interesting insights into what's going on in the different countries. Um, I'd like to pick up on that, um, you know, on some of those thoughts uh, within my presentation where I'd like to give you uh, a little bit of a glimpse at the content of the book that we are um, launching today in Spanish, French and Portuguese, the Handbook on Social Participation for Universal Health Coverage. And I'm presenting this on behalf of the whole team that participated and, um, and gave input into this handbook. And you'll see the link um, at the bottom of your screen. And on the next slide, you can see the links to the different language versions of this handbook. Um, next slide. So just to say, um, what is our approach uh, in the handbook um, to give you the context is um, first and foremost, um, I think it's important to clarify who was our target audience and um, our target audience were, were mainly policymakers, member states, governments. And you might ask at this point, why not civil society? Why not community groups? Why aren't they the, our target audience? And in fact, we discussed extensively with civil society and, and um, community groups, whether they should be the target audience. And the resounding response that we got from them was that um, civil society communities have a lot of um, documentation and um, and guidance that they write themselves for themselves um, in terms of how to better engage in participatory spaces, better engage with policies, better engage with governments. But where the um, the gap really lies is um, guidance towards policymakers, and they all acknowledge that policymakers really do struggle with this area of 
of ensuring that a participatory space is adequately managed, created, sustained, etc. And so this is why we had as our target audience member state governments and policymakers. It's also our mandate, uh, very much within our mandate as WHO to do so. Um, in the middle of this slide, you will see the different engagement modalities um, that we addressed. And this is a little bit of a of an artificial um, sort of delineation because they the different engagement modalities all um, sort of um, link with each other. But basically, we want wish to make sure to look at and study the engagement modalities that are directly engaging the population, lay people, citizens, residents, etc. But then also um, community engagement mechanisms. And the reason why we we separate out community engagement mechanisms is because within the health space, the different, um, especially vertical programs like malaria, HIV, maternal health, have a long-standing tradition and experience in engaging specific communities around those um, disease-specific or life course-specific areas. And we wanted to ensure that that experience and um, and insights that they were taking up into the handbook. So that's why we particularly look at community um, direct uh, engagement with communities as well. And then finally, the engagement, of course, through civil society and civil society organizations as media mediators in a way um, between governments and people. And then our context, the overarching context here that we're looking at is universal health coverage. Now, what that essentially means is that we were looking largely at policies and, um, and plans around universal health coverage related topics, which tend to be done more at the national level. Now, in some contexts, it can be subnational as well, but we, our focus was more at that level is how can we ensure that, um, that, you know, that participatory processes get taken up in that national level policy making, even if those processes might be at a local level at times. Next slide. Um, we had a uh, an external and internal advisory group for this uh, for handbook development, um, and they we steered the evidence generation for the handbook. You'll see the number of different case studies that we did. This is primary data collection that we did in nine countries. We also had um, eight literature reviews, and then several meetings with the external advisory group and with the internal. WHO expert group. The internal group was mainly um, consisting of of people in the within the organization who do quite a bit of work on community engagement, social participation, mainly coming from our um, vertical programs. Um, so experts from HIV and child health, etc., who are specifically um, working on the community engagement piece. Next slide. We also once we had a first draft and the key messages of the different handbook chapters, we did a, a quite a wide civil society consultation, which ended up being mainly online because it was around 2020, but we did a series of webinars to sort of introduce the civil society consultation. Um, we had a pretty uh, good um, response rate of this um, consultation, and we also allowed for open-ended comments and, um, and input. So, and then we actually took those open-ended comments and inputs and coded them to really flesh out what were the issues um, that civil society um, you know, was uh, wanted to focus on and felt that was working well in, in our key messages and the handbook content and what wasn't, and also to give it a little bit more sort of practical application. Is it really reflecting what's going on um, in on the ground? Next slide. So this is the outline of, um, of the handbook, and I'll go over this with you in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. Um, but you know, chapter one is really just an introductory part, uh, uh, piece where we also go into definitions. We did a review of the different terminologies used within social participation. And then we go into the enabling environment for participation, which is chapter two. And that's that you can go to the next slide. Um, this is really key, the enabling environment. This sets the scene for the five following chapters. And basically here we talk about the main common thread that we have throughout the whole handbook. And this is really, it's about power dynamics. And by power, what do we mean? We mean the ability to influence decisions and influence policies, health policies, and by extension, the implementation of those policies. And we know that certain groups in society traditionally have more influence over decisions and policies. Uh, every society in every country of the world has power dynamics that are influenced by, you know, 
politics, by the socioeconomic uh, situation of the country. Um, this is um, common across the world. And the point of, uh, the, of a participatory space is to ensure that everyone has equal um, an equal voice in an equal say into the policy question. But that means that one needs to acknowledge that some already have more access and more influence over policies and more power. And so the whole point of an enabling environment is to, is to sort of uh, recalibrate that balance and to, and to using format and design elements within the participatory space, attempt to give more voice and, um, and more uh, legitimacy to those who get generally have less of a voice. And this is quite a potent tool, if you so will, because um, minimizing power uh, asymmetries, because if designed in a way that really counters those barriers, those formal and informal barriers for equal participation can really um, um, come out with um, policies that are targeted and that um, targeted towards those people and those groups where the health outcomes are the poorest. It's challenging because the participatory space is not um, in a vacuum away from the rest of society. And obviously with the work that we do within the participatory space, we're not going to solve societal problems. But what we can do is within the participatory space, acknowledge those imbalances and do what we can within the format and design elements that we have under our control to ensure that those who have less of a voice gain more of a voice. And this is essentially what this handbook is about, is how to do that. And that's what, that why this is the next five topics, which are addressed in the next five chapters, go into the how-to of the different topics. And we'll go to the next slide, starting with representation, uh, rep representativity. This is a, a big issue in the literature, in the academic literature. This topic comes up a lot. It comes up as sort of the, the key element of how to ensure that participation and participation spaces work well. But when you look at um, actual practice and the country examples that we looked at in details, we see that policymakers actually um, don't put much thought into this. Uh, and it's something that's done a little bit in, a, in an ad hoc uh, sort of way. So um, finding the so-called right representatives is actually extremely key. And what is right? It's basically, you know, are they considered legitimate? Are they able to represent either a constituency or an idea, or at least their own individual experience. And this is important because if the people within the participatory space are not seen as representative, are not seen as legitimate, then the results that are coming out of that space are also not seen as representative or seen as legitimate, and then it has less of a policy update. So this is a, this is a, a key issue. And um, the, main message of this chapter in terms of how to select representatives is you know is that one needs to first and foremost clearly define the objective of the space what do we want to get out of it what is the policy question we want to answer and based on that there is a, there are a list of sort of right representatives because if we're talking about diabetes we have a different set of people that we might want to speak to than if we're talking about general um, health sector reform, for example. And the main point also here is that um, the, once the policy question is clear and the kinds of people that you would like to have around that policy question is also clear, it, one needs to make the representative roles and the reason for selection of each and every participant very clear and transparent. And this is also key, is to be very transparent about why each person is there and has been selected to be there. And why is that important? Because especially those who don't have the kind of position or title that gives them an automatic legitimacy and representation, representative power, will then be lent that legitimacy when clarified why they are there and why we've asked them to be there. If we've asked them to come because we are interested in their particular individual experience, because we feel that that's an experience that might be repeated elsewhere in society, we need to make that clear. So they're not expected, for example, to represent a constituency, but we, we want to make it clear that they're there for their own individual experience. Another person might be there to represent a constituency. Others, often civil society organizations, are there to represent a sort of idea or expertise area like women's health, but that needs to be made uh, clear. And on your screen, you'll see various format and design elements that 
are, are very key for raising um, legitimacy and power of the different representatives and there's more detail in the chapter. Next slide. Um, then we have the chapter here on uh, capacity. Uh, capacities is very key. Again, the common thread throughout the book is about power. So capacity is about ensuring that we build capacities to raise the legitimacy and, and, and power, power and the balance of power, recalibrating that balance of power, which is ultimately rooted in expertise, knowledge, speaking skills, etc. And here we really go into the capacities needed for policymakers as well in order to act to organize and manage a space and analyze the stakeholders. Uh, the stakeholders analyze um, the, the participant field and the format and design elements that they can put into place in order to recalibrate that balance of power. Those are skills that, a skill set that uh, policymakers need. And this, this is a capacity that needs to be built. And we see that this capacity is, is lacking quite often in um, in, in ministries and across the board, and is not given the adequate importance and political priority that it probably should. So, about the capacity is really about trying to create that level playing field. And then we go into the different kinds of um, capacities. We have we propose a sort of framework of the different kinds of skills needed, both on the government side and the civil society and community side. Although the emphasis in this chapter is really about what governments can do to facilitate the testing uh, of civil society and communities rather than and um, and on the government capacities as well. Um, next slide. Then um, our chapter five is really looking at um, policy uptake. So from what do we do with the results of the participatory spaces and the literature is very clear that there is a, they call it a deliberation to policy gap which is uh, that public participation initiatives unfortunately have insufficient influence on decision making. And a lot of it is about just because the representation issue hasn't been adequately addressed and because the format and design issues haven't, haven't been adequately addressed. So it's all linked together. But another reason is really is that sometimes policy uptake is not always seen as a priority in participatory governance processes. There's a, a very strong value-driven argument often put forward that participation is a value in and of itself, an intrinsic goal. Um, and um, and another issue within the health space specifically is that often the participation and participatory process have a very clear service delivery objective. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, a very clear objective to increase utilization rates of health centers, for example, or um, increase coverage uh, of uh, malaria related services, etc. And once that is fulfilled, then the rest, um, then the participatory process is seen as sort of finished. And, um, you know, those processes that tend to have more of a, what I would call a governance objective, which is more just to listen and try to capture the voice of people to see what, uh, you know, what are their, what are the barriers that they're facing, what are their issues in their interface with the health, uh, health system, th those tend to have a little bit more um, policy uptake and um, because the, uh, the overall objective is quite, um, quite different. Um, and another final point here is that, um, you know, when it comes to policy uptake, is what we see is that it's not enough to have high level political will, and that often we have, um, at least for the principle of participation, but those mid-level government cadres need to also be convinced. Those who hold budget, those who actually write policies, if they're just told from top down that they need to, you know, do more participation, do some civil society consultations that are not given the capacity building to be able to do it properly nor the budget nor are convinced themselves that it's actually useful for their own policy purposes then it's not going to happen and it's definitely not going to happen in a sort of long-term um, institutionalized way institutionalized government initiated spaces for participation tend to have higher policy uptake this is what we found in our in our, in our research, um, even if there are some downsides to institutionalization, which can be counterbalanced if reflected on and thought through well. Next slide. Um, and then um, legal frameworks for participation. I, I, see I don't have too much time left. So I just want to say very briefly here um, that we did an analysis of various legal frameworks. I think the main point here is that look, uh, legal frameworks um, in and of themselves are important. Um, it's better to have them than to not have them, but having them doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have good participation. Um, you need to have the capacities at the same time. You need to have a political prioritization. You need to have a budget as well. 
Um, next slide. And finally, we go into the sustainability aspect of participatory spaces um, and you know, what actions are uh, required to ensure that these spaces are not one off because what we see, especially in the COVID context, is a lot of ad hoc participatory spaces pop, you know, popping up and ad hoc um, consultations. But then once the, the COVID crisis was seen as finished, they um, were dismantled and, um, and not continued. Um, but sustainability, it's important to think about it from the beginning when designing these spaces, especially because participation is largely voluntary. And if we want people to continue participating, we need to give them a reason to do so. And one of the biggest incentives is if they see that their um, input is actually being taken up into policies that's being used and it's been, that it's useful um, in, and that a culture of participation is being built. And one of the best way to have um, to increase sustainability is to just do, do more participatory spaces, have more exposure to each other and have that practice in a way of, um, you know, uh, practice of participation to be able to increase also capacities and build that culture of participation which leads to better sustainability um, as well. Um, and I'll end there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to say, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity there's a lot more detail in the handbook as well i really just ran through very superficially some of these key issues but again i think the underlying message is that you know participation and, and ensuring more participation of people communities and civil societies in you know health policy and decision making is ultimately about recalibrating that balance of power and convincing those who already have more power that it's also in their interest in the end uh, to do so thank you very much eh, muchas gracias, Deepa, por tu presentación y tus comentarios y por especialmente... Thank you so much, Deepa, for your presentation and remarks, and especially your availability for holding this presentation from the airport. Since Deepa is traveling in some place around the planet, so thank you so much, Deepa. She will have to take her flight in a bit, so I would like to take this chance to introduce Deepa's colleague, who is also known in Geneva, who will be with us for discussion at the end of the webinar. I mean, Akira Kopp who is uh, a graduate in science, health sciences from the German university. She currently works in funding of healthcare systems. She's co-editor of the WHO manual on social participation. She will be with us until the end of our session. As general remark, we are very happy with these important translations of the manual on social participation into languages in our region. The manual offers countries a valuable tool for installing, maintaining, and strengthening social participation. There's much to be done and to do in this area. The manual addresses the arduous and decisive matter on how and in the interaction regulating systematically the authorities' relationship to the communities, society, and civil society. So next, we will open up the space for Q&A, but first, we want to invite our guests to react on the social participation manual presented by Deepa from WHO. And later we would be handing the floor to them so that they can answer questions and provide remarks to all of us. To begin then, we would like to invite Walter from Guatemala. Walter also participated in consultation processes and drafting of this manual published recently by the WHO in May of 2021. Walter, your remarks. Yes, I believe that seeing the manual finished is a very important uh, duty. Consultation took a long time. And what I would like to highlight is are two main elements. The first is case studies that we have on concrete examples on how it can be implemented in countries and also understanding that um, exercising um, citizenship participation, although it's a political action, it also requires conceptual frameworks, application of methods and techniques for dialogue, negotiation, and to reach consensus, etc. So what I want to highlight with this is that it is a process that must be 
tailored to every situation. Every situation must find which are the best methods and techniques to create this exchange among citizenship and authorities. And the second issue that I would like to unpack, which is very important, is that we see that citizenship participation in healthcare systems, usually we've seen it to further coverage, which is important, but healthcare systems are one of the most important assets in our societies and all healthcare systems may and have contributed to strengthen our democracies as well. So citizen participation in order to participate in democratic governance of the healthcare system is also important and it is equally important than reaching coverage goals. So let's see and acknowledge that in all our healthcare system, it is one of the most important elements to generate an exchange space between citizenship and public institutions. So also let's give the importance in generating more spaces for participation and strengthening democratic governance. And here I will stop. Thank you so much, Walter. We're now handing the floor to Fernando in case he has remarks on the manual, Fernando. First, I would like to thank other constituents since we also I would like to thank all of the contributions and I would like to say that we were there. We participated the in creating uh, the manual. We were in the debates and I would like to point, speak about the manual, the manual in Brazil. In our case, the National Health Advisory Board was part of building we believe this manual. That it is important and we thought it was very important that it was not directed only for not the only have this for ministry, the ministry of and obviously and of course, this may this have caused bring some sort of some uh, contradictions uh, issues and because it's an issue that speaks about participation. This manual which speaks of participation, I'm not sure how it for happened us, in other it countries, was but to it was important be aware that, to yes, have the, the notion of that yes, need ministries of healthcare yes, need to participate and that like there is institutionalization and sometimes they like are in Brazil, contrary. but there like, for example, is often I a contradiction. I cannot too many times stop the act the government today that the in Brazil uh, government uh, is going through this really process of participation in terms of with popular that is guaranteed constitutionally, but even, but in cases when even so in those countries where there is no such guarantee, uh, it is important in, to in uh, have uh, a popular participation movement in are popular social to movements sure to guarantee that this is a manual for that, that manual is, that to have this type of that participation. participation in case of Brazil, which in our case it, it have, is had, but for the OMS, uh, WHO, but also in WHO, WHO their contribution we can must be there. Reel in elements social movements must that be there make effective for healthcare systems and from the point of view of evaluation and monitoring, systems. we must also and consider and assessment, we have to consider we'll, we'll have elements. more information in the future, but I would like to underline that the under the manual itself speaks about the process of monitoring and evaluation, and we must bear in mind how each country's contribution for this manual was done and should any changes be made to their contribution in the future to make sure that the people who are building this healthcare system or working to face the difficulties that the population it lives through uh, are in fact part of building this manual? Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando. We now pass the floor. Thank you, Hernan. Really, for us, the value the document has in itself is a guideline or recommendation from WHO is fundamental to establish a number of concepts such as um, social participation, possibly in different countries, it's understood in different ways and what are the participatory processes in society that can be translated not only in uh, health policies, but also uh, other mechanisms for um, accountability. At least I understand that as fundamental. 
on the other hand, hand by having a backup of the WHO and having participated in the, in its preparation, perhaps in the future, it can generate um, decisions or resolutions in the General Assembly or the um, board. And I think also that's important to establish a political com commitment, something that is important in social participation too. That um, uh, political commitment from the authorities should be translated in more effective and efficient and real um, participation uh, it, that should lead to public consultation, suggestion of changes in uh, health policies or in the uh, healthcare system. And that uh, is social participation concerning uh, decisions made by the authorities. We can get into more detail after reading the publication, but I think these tools are fundamental to progress in a number of processes. And Thank you very much, Luis. Perhaps I should pass the floor to Tipe again so she can briefly respond to some questions or comments, and then we go to the questions that are arriving from the audience that are very good questions. Tipa. Hi, uh, Hernan and colleagues, and thank you very much uh, uh, for those comments. And I think it just, you know, what it does, uh, I think it really grounds us into the reality in, in countries in terms of what our, our main challenges are. Um, you know, different aspects were mentioned, such as, you know, accountability mechanisms, um, you know, different kinds of uh, boards uh, that are, that might be needed, um, or uh, civil society, et cetera. And, um, and, you know, the role of, of, of WHO in engaging with the different countries. And I think these are all um, the issues that moving forward, we would like to, as WHO and as, as PAHO, of course, um, would like to engage with all of you in, um, very closely, particularly because we are moving towards a resolution um, in the World Health Assembly in a couple of years on this topic, and we need uh, your support, and not only your support, but we also need to see um, and better understand what your needs are in terms of the support that we can we can provide in um, in the participatory processes that uh, that you are undertaking in in your countries and fine tune use that to fine tune our recommendations as well um the, the handbook focused very much on sort of more macro level health policy making however we realize that participation is just as important for implementation of those policies for monitoring and evaluation which was very uh, which, was, which was brought up um, in the comments and that monitoring and evaluation is really a key aspect of accountability and for the the World Health Assembly resolution, we would like to have a monitoring and evaluation framework with, with key indicators on participation where countries can then get a sense of where they are in terms of their participatory spaces, where improvements can be made, and we'd like to support that, of course, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepa. Uh, are you going to be available because we'll have like 25 continue. minutes more? Are you going to continue or your colleague? Continuing, he's online. Okay. And so I would like to say bye to everyone and thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Deepa, y buen viaje. <laughs> thank you, cheers. Thank you very bueno, much, Deepa. I hope you have a good uh, trip. So thank you very much for this part. And now we'll continue and open this space uh, for Q and A um, of all of you, and not only our guests. We have received several questions. And at this stage, it's also always difficult to um, use all the questions. But we have excellent questions and show the great interest and knowledge our seminar participants have. It's not easy to choose a few and generate some 
eh, eh, dar unas preguntas direccionadas. Eh, However, a... I'll try, eh, try to direct some questions. Me voy a tomar la Although dirección. we receive them without their names. So I'm going to direct them according to presentations. The first question will be done to Kira. How do you see the role of research, action, participation to strengthen social participation, developing, uh, training, and uh, research actions based on uh, local uh, responses and uh, the communities as protagonists? Uh, a very interesting question. Uh, and I think we have to be a lot more action oriented. And I think that was also one of the points that Deepa wanted to make in, in our, uh, in the handbook that we've put forward to provide recommendations that are practical, uh, practical and relatable so that it can actually be used by government uh, actors. And I think here, I just wanted to mention that it's important that we have that high level commitment from uh, the highest level of governments, but also um, building those capacities. And that's really what we try uh, to, to do now in, in the coming um, months and, and years to build those government capacities so that they can meaningfully engage um, with civil society communities and population groups. I think one other part, which I think is important when we look a little bit more on that research and the action oriented is really that inclusion and the awareness that all kinds of evidence is actually important in order to take and inform policy making processes. And here I'm referring that often traditionally we are looking at medical technical evidence, um, but it's also those uh, knowledge, the evidence, the vast experience from those people with lived experiences that we take and need to consider a lot more when we are forming those uh, policies, elaboration, uh, etc. So I think that is one of the key elements that we need to put forward in order to make this agenda more action oriented and reduce that gap uh, that we currently see uh, so that those meaningful um, considerations, contributions are, are considered and taken forward. Over to you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Kira. Thank you very much, here, Kira. I will now address a question to Luis. It says, not only the ministries of health should participate or intervene in social participation. The question is, how should universities that have um, um, medicine, nursing, and obstetrics uh, schools participate? Thank you for the question. Yes, I think the the term of civil society academia, or um, civil society authorities involve in many Uruguay. actors in the academia there are several several participation um, um, ways to participate in uh, decision making it's not only the academia uh, and uh, scientific societies, but also other organizations that can contribute in the construction of uh, collective processes. Uh, despite the fact that we have quite a broad experience in some public consultation processes, I understand that the true social participation should start with collective construction from the start when we develop the policies, and we have many more challenges there, particularly as uh, health authorities, but also as government in Uruguay. And I think the situation is not very different in other countries in our region. We have to progress towards that, develop true uh, collective construction processes for our policies. The big challenge is there. Of course, we need to include the academia uh, because of their research too. And I think uh, there are uh, particular debts in Uruguay in that regard. And the same thing happens in the region. Pablo uh, had a very important made a very uh, important thesis on the um, public healthcare system in Uruguay. 
Pero yes, a big step. So we need to contribute from the academia and all society participants in this role of uh, building collective action. Thank you very much, Luis. Now the next question is for Fernando. Fernando, oftentimes the uh, government and its institutions uh, try to protect, guard, and uh, direct social participation. But social participation is an effort to democratize society. How can it be autonomous and binding? This is a very important question. And here in Brazil, uh, due to our experience in, this, in these last few years, we have seen how key it is to be autonomous, even if the national advisory boards, the national state and municipal boards, they have organizational and institutionalized uh, structures, but they must also be autonomous. They must be autonomously able to decide and uh, to monitor and contribute to planning. But it is very important for us to know the way this relationship with the people, those who are in government and those who work with social control needs what we call in Brazil, a lot of struggle. We need to put up a struggle. We know that, that there's a tendency to tutelage. No, no matter which type of government we're speaking about, it's something that we must face. It's not because of a government has a more open dialogue or a better relationship or understands the role of uh, social commitments better. It means that there is no attempt to of tutelage or control or direct social control. So we must really re respect autonomy, but the state itself must create the conditions that include sustainability in terms of administration, financial, for this autonomy. Just to give you an example for next year, the budget that is that for public health, if our country, Brazil as a whole, has had a cut, a diminution of 23 billion reais. We are fighting very hard to get this money back with the transition committee for the next government. Within the cuts, 60% of the budget of the National Advisory Board has been cut. 60% of the funds for the conference has been cut. And there is no funds for a conference on mental health that was that was supposed to happen. So we need autonomy and we must be sure that our autonomy is exercised in full. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, now, Walter, how can we make sure that there is equitable participation of the most vulnerable groups in community participation? The experiences of LGBTIQ plus um communities was critical to achieve treat uh, equal treatment uh, before the law and there are no clear institutional mechanisms that ensure their participation walter yes as i mentioned when i presented even when the region has progressed a lot in participation we still have gaps that we have to close. This is why I was saying that now that we are uh, restarting participation, we have to evolve and not, not do as before. In several countries, there are citizen participation spaces, but they are structured according to how public officials work. Like for example, participation spaces in their schedules or only for Monday to Friday. These, these spaces exclude people who, because of their work, cannot attend, or spaces that are structured in a public office. Que genera be provincial or national, and that generates uh, um, costs of opportunities for participating 
in people who live in rural areas. So we have to innovate our participation structures, not only based on what's useful uh, for public officials, but also find uh, spaces where all can participate. So what we need to do is to innovate structures, try to reduce barriers in vulnerable populations as much as possible. These are barriers that are direct or indirect, and there are many yeah, things well, to do there in the region. Thank you very much, Walter. <clears throat> and to all guests and panelists who have uh, shared their thoughts with us, as I said, it's always difficult to select just a few questions, but everything that you ask is recorded in the chat's comments and in questions and answers. And this is a process that will continue. I wanted to thank all participants for their questions, which have been excellent. I have one more here that I will ask Ernesto when I introduce him, because it has to do with international cooperation and how we will continue supporting. I wanted to thank our guests for their comments and questions. Before going to the conclusion uh, section, we'd like to remember, remind you that the recording of this event plus the presentations and materials will be soon available in the website devoted to our seminars. Um, and we will share them with you there. Now to um, wrap up, we're going to pass the floor to Dr. Ernesto Vascoli. Ernesto is advi regional advisor on governance, leadership policies and uh, planning of health of WHO PAHO and interim head of health and access at PAHO. He's an economist um, and has much experience uh, in public health. He has a PhD on governance and uh, uh, health services. Um, Ernesto, perhaps the last question goes for you before you wrap up. Uh, it has to do with the, your uh, final comments. Uh, lots of social participation has been supported by international cooperation. If these organizations, when these organizations uh, withdraw, participation decreases or disappears, what mechanisms can we use to prevent that? Thank you very much, Hernán. First of all, for having accepted, accepted our invitation to uh, moderate this calidad, event and for having de, said so, de, 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 done so, uh, so well with your warmth and quality. Voy a de I mean it. Um, first of all, I'd like to respond to this question, perhaps with a title and also the general thoughts of the entire process. I think it's a very good question to acknowledge common points in our debate. If there is something that sends an alert and generates one of the fundamental challenges it is that social participation should not be an episode related with technical cooperation or with any exercise that would not institutionalize processes where the voice of civil society and different uh, government structures are articulated in the health system and in connection uh, to the oh, health system with influence um, of other structures in the uh, health system. This has to do with the institutionalization of social participation as part of citizenship exercises, how to defend democratic mechanisms that are not only in political systems, but also in active participation um, 
uh, of society in uh, health care and in many other things. There is great wealth in many of the manual. things we have heard, the experiences we have heard about, the manual for social participation that Deepa presented. So I'd like to wrap up this debate by emphasizing some topics we consider key and that are definitely common points in um, all these presentations. We always say that the starting point is the right to health, and it's firmly acknowledged in the Americas, and it's even enshrined in the constitution of 19 of our member states. We understand it as a fundamental pillar of a health care system. We talk a lot we talk a lot about um, changing them and strengthening them, but we have to base them in the true needs of people, families, and communities. And to identify these needs, we need to actively listen to the voice of the people. We need to interpret their needs and expectations, not only in terms of results or maps, or epidemiological problems, their own opinions, what the population needs in terms of their expectations. Within that framework, the participation space and processes are crucial to incorporate their voice, interests, and beliefs, not only on how services are provided, but also on how public policies um, are implemented. Another important uh, learning from the pandemic is the relevance of trust, a key word. Participation of people, families, and communities is critical to build and keep the trust of people. We will succeed only thanks to this trust. This attribute tells a lot about the relationship of uh, health systems and population, but also uh, the structure of um, government and civil society. Social participation is an instrument that strengthens our democracies. Now, going back to public uh, health policies, we need to become more resilient in our healthcare systems in case of a new emergency or pandemic. And the, hence, I need to emphasize the importance of primary care as a fundamental strategy uh, in which PAHO has worked with the countries in the region. Uh, precisely, one of its principles, as James said, is participation. It's vital for healthcare systems to build all necessary spaces to guarantee that people's voices and interests are taken into account, both in terms of their needs and their critical evaluation, their critical opinion concerning what happened in the pandemic, what were the weaknesses in our systems, how the pandemic exacerbated the negative impact of these weaknesses, and why not uh, saying the negative impact of structural inequities due to structural inequities in our countries. As uh, Carice uh, Etienne said, uh, the strategy to establish resilient healthcare system and recovery after the um, COVID-19 pandemic to protect and uh, improve public health achievements was approved by PAHO member states last year and has provided some new guidelines to technically recover, technically cooperate with governments. This strategy emphasizes the importance of social participation as an integral part of public health 
function. Y, y de alguna also forma renewed, as James uh, said, um, and also this helps the transformation of healthcare agendas and uh, access to health and individual and collective services is in the core of this. And our countries need to invest, create, um, and uh, strengthen and uh, generate different social participation spaces where people can in, get involved, participate, um, um, and uh, demand accountability of leaders and healthcare systems. So there's collective action towards uh, uh, universal health. We have to um, broaden structured mechanisms for social participation, acknowledging the contribution of informal processes to, in this way, we will be able to listen to the voices of those who weren't heard. This is how we will improve our commitment, transparency, and responsibility. It's important to build coalitions of countries that go beyond government and ministries of health la familia, la to include other actors, people, families, communities, and their social organizations. This is why we are motivated to see all these initiatives, all this debate and the participation processes of so many people, actors and institutions that have been part of this seminar. As mentioned in this webinar, and I'd like to reiterate it, uh, we launched the version in Spanish, Portuguese, and French. This is the manual of, manual of social participation for universal health. And this is a fundamental uh, departure to achieve regular and systematic commitment of government, population, communities, and civil society. The idea is to achieve universal health in our country, and this requires joint uh, commitment and collaboration. At PAHO, we reiterate our commitment of providing all of our technical capacity to support member states in achieving this objective. We congratulate you for your dedication. We thank you for your interest and participation in today's seminar. In the following weeks, we will invite you to our next and last seminar, well, this is a virtual seminar in this series that will take place on December 9th, and that will focus on the role of public health as an indispensable part in the agenda of uh, transformation and strengthening of healthcare systems in the Americas. Thank you and greetings to all of you. Thank you, Hernan, again. I thank you very much for your support and participation. Thank you very much, Ernesto, for this excellent closing and very positive uh, reflection, looking ahead in building on progress made and addressing the many challenges we have ahead in this process. So final thanks to all of you for connecting and participating in this seminar. Have a great day. See you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.